Uh, today we're going to do Laplace equation. Uh, the way we solve it will be pretty similar to solving a heat equation. But I do want to spend some time explaining uh, where we get this differential equation from because uh, by doing so you can kind of uh, have a feel for what the solution might look like. So in order to get to the Laplace equation, we first have to talk about the 2D, 2D heat equation. And uh, to, to talk about the 2D heat equation, we first have to talk about the 1D heat equation because remember how we talked about the heat equation? Uh, if the concavity is positive, then the heat will increase and if concavity is negative then the heat will decrease so we kind of uh, uh, made some argument to say that the, the rate of change of U with respect to T uh, by the way this is a symbol for partial U with respect to partial T uh, is proportional to uh, the second derivative with respect to x. And uh, yeah, that's, the that's the second derivative with respect to x. And uh, if you change this into an equation, you just u need to use the proportionality constant, so it's some k times uxx, right? OK. Uh, now, this changes somewhat when you try to do the same thing in 2D because, well, 2D heat equation would mean that you have like a, some two-dimensional plate viewed from above and, and uh, once again you kind of expect to have some kind of uh, insulation above and be below, insulation above and below so that uh, the only place that it's going to lose heat or, or gain heat will be from these boundaries, okay? So that will be a two-dimensional heat situation. And uh, because the heat distribution uh, now is going to be a two-dimensional function, right? So at, at a given time t, the heat distribution will depend on the x coordinate and, and, and the y coordinate. So your heat function or the temperature function would be temperature at location x comma y at time t uh, will, will so, so the, the temperature function will be a function of two spatial variables okay, at a given time slice t. So then you have to think about what's going to happen for a two-dimensional heat distribution like this one. And if you have a heat distribution that's like this, then it, it's kind of easy to tell. It's going to, the temperature will what? Would it increase or decrease? It will increase, right? So if the concavity is like this, again, the U, UT would be positive, so that's easy to see. What's not so clear is when you have uh, something like a saddle. What's a saddle? Do you remember what a saddle is? It's like a yeah, so, so it's like this way and then like that the other way, right? Because if you look at this point and you try to judge whether the, the temperature is going to go up or down, if you view it this way, the temperature seems to, should, it should go up, but then you view it this way, it should go down, right? So you kind of don't know what's going to happen. But then, uh, if you think a little bit further, you kind of realize that the, these two concavities don't have to match <coughs> each other. So you can have a case where, so let's just say this direction is x and this direction is y. And uh, you have uxx and uyy. And think about the case like when this concavity is like 1, but this is kind of overpowering this one. So let's say the concavity of this is negative 2. If this is negative 2 and this is positive 1, 
would you expect the temperature to go up or down? Yeah. It should go down, right? Because this is going to overpower the other one, right? So uh, after a, a bit of thinking, you realize what you want to do is you want to take the sum of two concavities, and that should be what's controlling the, the uh, temperature change. Rate of change of the temperature should be this value. Yes? Would that be if like one side has like less insulation than the other, or if it's not insulated? No, 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 no uh, it, the, the insulation thingy is only just so that this is a two-dimensional problem. Okay. If, it's, if, if I don't have the insulation up and down, then you start losing the heat this way, and that becomes a three-dimensional problem, and you don't, you don't want to deal with that. I'm just trying to make it simpler. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, if you want a three-dimensional one, then, then you, so for the three-dimensional one, it's going to be like this, x, y, z, t, because now you have uh, three spatial variables for the location, right? It'll be a block rather than a, a thin, thin plate. And then instead of this, you, you'll need to do u, x, x plus u, y, y plus u, z, z. That's what you'll need. So that's what you have. Okay, but, but back to this. Uh, now, at this point, uh, you might be already sold that this is what you want. You want to say that the change of the temperature with respect to time should be proportional to this quantity. However, uh, some people might still object. Some smart people might object. Uh, who's smart here? Anyone object? Nick. Nick. Smart, yeah. do, do you have any objection to doing this? 20, 24 now. No? No? Uh, yeah? Wouldn't it be, you can't do that because that would just be an up concavity? Have no, it's fine. So if it's like this, then, then you have, both of these will be positive. Mm -hmm. So it's going to go, go even faster. Yeah. So uh, what, one way that some, somebody would object is the following. You might say, why are you looking at the concavity only in the x direction and the y direction? Because you, you can certainly talk about concavity in any slice. So you can see you can take this surface and you, you can slide in slice in a, any direction, and you get a, a, a cross section, and that cross section will have concavity, right? So why are we just thinking of concavity in two directions? Not, uh, shouldn't you be thinking of concavity in all directions? That could be uh, a, a pretty good argument against this. And uh, so you actually have to think about what happens to concavity in general. And to talk about that, I'll need to, I'll need to think about uh, what happens to concavity in general. So here's the formula to get the concavity in any direction. So first what you need to do is you have to take, uh, you have to calculate something called a Hessian. So Hessian of a function is defined as all the possible second derivatives. Right? So you, if you have a, a function of x and y, then you can take f and you differentiate twice in x, or you could also differentiate once in x and once in y, or you can differentiate once in y and then x, or you can differentiate twice in y. So that, that's called Hessian, okay? And, uh, yeah, you remember Hessian? I do remember Hessian. I'm just a little confused about the ut and then the alpha symbol there. No, ut, this means proportional. Oh, that's proportional? Yeah, so, so just, just like here. Oh, okay. Yeah, the rate of change of the temperature is proportional to how concave it is. But here I'm saying that the rate of change of the temperature is proportional to the sum of two directions of concavity. Yeah, and, and my objection is, uh, why are you just considering the two directions? Uh, shouldn't it be all the directions? Yeah. Okay, and, and I'm trying to explain that. Okay. So let, let's take this, this uh, saddle point and, and think about what it looks like from top-down view with some, some uh, level curves. So um, 
in the you're going to have something like this. like that and uh, as you go in the y direction it's falling down so this is this is like k equals to negative one or not that k but uh, the, the level of z z equals to negative one z equals to negative two over here would be z equals to one and z equals to two so as you go this way or that way you're you're ele you're going up you're elevating you're going up uh, this way or that way you're 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 uh, descending you're ascending this way, descending that way, okay? And uh, at, any, at any direction, you can choose a, a unit vector. So let's say you choose some direction here, uh, unit vector v hat, and let's say this is a comma b. Then uh, what you can do is to get the directional derivative with respect to the v of u, okay? and you do it twice, which means uh, you're measuring the concavity of u t in the v direction. Okay? Uh, you, you can show that this is same as, and this is, by the way, uh, you have the directional derivative formula uh, which is the, the gradient of u dot with v hat, okay? And uh, if you do it twice, you can just prove that this is true, but uh, it's easier if you write in Hessian. What happens is that this is the same as a, b, uh, and then u, x, x, u, x, y, u, y, x, and u, y, y, and then you have a, b where a, b is this vector, okay? So, so uh, if you, so this, this is like just taking matrix multiplication and, and uh, another matrix multiplication. You, you, doing this will give you the second derivative, okay? So, so in other words, uh, the Hessian will, will uh, capture all the possible second derivative in any direction. Okay, and uh, using this, I'm kind of uh, hand waving here. I'm skipping some steps, but it, this this all requires careful calculation to really convince yourself. But uh, it also is somewhat reasonable. So uh, another thing that you you realize after doing this, if you go all the way around doing this calculation, you're going to see that. Uh, uh, there's one direction where this concavity is the highest, okay? And there's one direction which is the minimum. O of course, uh, you, might ha you might have a situation where it's all the same. But if there is indeed a highest point, highest direction, and the minimal direction, you can show that the two directions will be perpendicular to each other. Kind of interesting, right? Yeah. Um, and you, you can do it by... Uh, thinking of this as like cosine theta, comma sine theta, and these as constant values, right? And you write this out, and that's a, that's a function of theta, which is theta is the direction, okay? And you can just differentiate that and uh, assume that you have two directions where it's maximum and minimum. You will see that there's like exactly two places where <coughs> they should be perpendicular to each other, okay? Uh, now. Uh, another I interesting thing is uh, this right here is just the trace of this Hessian function. So, so you see this this matrix. If you take this he Hessian and you add up the trace, which is, which means that you're adding the diagonals, then uh, that's the trace, and this is. Uh, actually something that you need to have some knowledge of linear algebra to, to actually fully be convinced. And what happens is that the trace is invariant under any rotation. So, so what's going to happen is that uh, uh, if you take the saddle and you, you rotate in any way and keep, keep 
calculating this, this will stay the same. And actually, that's a very important feature uh, because um, it's an important feature because you, the, the heat equation should be invariant under a rotation, right? You, if, if there's a shape of heat distribution like this, you would uh, expect the, the rate of change of the heat to be related to the, the shape of the heat rather than how, it's, uh, how you put the coordinates on, okay? So that's an important feature. And also, uh, because of what I said, it's really, you, you can even think of this as like, a, it's same thing as adding the highest curvature in one direction and the lowest curvature on the other direction because they're, they're orthogonal, okay? So it, it really becomes a, a function on the shape of the heat distribution at the point. Uh, and it, it really uh, takes account of all directions rather than just one, because all of these are really related to this, and it's just taking the trace of it, okay? So that, that's like uh, one justification of why I'm not taking account of all the directions, just these. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to say that this is enough to capture the concavity of this shape in, in any way, okay? All right. Uh, so if you're, if you're sold, now we can, now we can write down the two-dimensional heat equation, which is, uh, you can always change a proportionality uh, argument by saying it's equal to the other one through a proportionally constant k. So it's k times uxx plus uyy. Okay, so that's the heat equation, two-dimensional heat equation. And uh, if it's three-dimensional, you can put additional u, uzz in there. And uh, that's actually, it, once you have a 3D, it's very practical because you can use it to model any kind of uh, objects when you're interested in the heat distribution. So for example, if you're a me mechanical engineer and you're trying to uh, design some parts and you want to know what kind of heat it's going to be subject to. You might have like a, some part here and there's an engine here which is very hot but then uh, this is touching the outside which is could be really cold and then you want to see how, how the heat distribution will look like here. You can actually solve the three-dimensional heat equation to, to find it. Right? Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now, uh, now we have to get to the Laplace differential equation uh, by thinking of the following problem. So let's think about the following case where you have a, a 10 foot by 10 foot room and uh, the ground and the, uh, the roof are well insulated. So uh, there's no heat loss there, but then uh, on, on one side, uh, oh, 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 um, let's say on one side you have a radiator that's keeping constant at eight, 80 degrees Fahrenheit right here. Okay? But uh, the outside is really, really cold and outside is zero degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? Zero degrees. Which means very cold, right? It's very, very cold. Uh, Okay, uh, and then initially this was cold. Uh, they were they left the, the house for a while and they just came in. It's so so cold. They uh, got the radiator working and hoping that the house would warm up. Okay, but then uh, you, usually your uh, maximum heat loss is through the windows. But that's just to make it simple. We'll just make it uh, make all three sides to be glass, just completely glass, so that you're, you're losing all the heat. It's just zero, zero, okay? Um, of course, a more realistic one will be like you have uh, the boundary condition here as insulated, but you have some windows which will give you some very cold thing and st stuff like that, but <coughs> anyways, uh, we're just trying to make it simple. Um, and then, you, you, you kind of want to wait and see what the heat distribution is. 
Uh, but think of it like this. More often than not, you're more interested in the steady state solution rather than what's happening in between. Do you agree? Right? Okay. So even here, you might even want to consider like the steady state. So after some time, what's going to be like the heat distribution here? You can already have some image of what it, it's going to look like, right? It looks like, I would say, something like this. There will be the level curves. Right? Uh, that's, that, I think that's what the, the shape should look like, if, if you know what I mean. But, but anyways, uh, so the important thing is this. We have the heat equation. But what happens, uh, uh, no, uh, what happens to UT when you have the steady state solution? First of all, when do you get the steady state solution? Steady state means it stops changing, right? Yeah, yeah. So at infinite time, after a long, long time later, it's going to reach some steady state. There's no change, okay? So that's like t sent to infinity, right? But at that, at that point, what will be the value of ut? Zero. It would be zero because there is no change. There is no rate of change with respect to time. So when you get to steady state, what you get is zero is equal to k times uxx plus uyy. And that means you end up with you end up with what we call the Laplace PDE, which is uxx plus uyy has to equal to zero. That's because if, if this is zero, and then k is something positive, so if you divide by k, you get this equal to zero. And that's called the Laplace differential equation. Now, uh, often you will see that this Laplace differential equation is written as triangle u equals to zero uh, because this this triangle is called the Laplacian Laplacian and it means two derivatives in x and two derivatives in y. That, that's called the Laplacian. And of course, uh, if it's three-dimensional, you're going to have one extra plus uzz and plus second derivative z. So that will be the th third order, uh, uh, no, uh, 3D Laplacian differential equation. And this means that, uh, this differential equation means that you're looking for the steady state solution of the 2D heat equation or the 3D heat equation, depending on whether you have the Z or not, okay? Now, although uh, I just talked in, con in the context of heat, I want to say that uh, this differential equation has another origin, uh, which may be even more important. And uh, let me ex try to explain that one, although that's, that's even harder to explain. Uh, it, it works like this. So if you have V, which is electric potential, does anyone know what you get if you differentiate the electric potential? You learned this in Calc 2. If you differentiate the electric potential, what do you get? Actually, it's, it's negative of the gradient of the electric potential. Do you know what you get? Who, who's taking uh, physics 2 right now? Anyone? You've already taken it, right? Okay. Who took it just last semester? Do you know? No? No? Ah. Okay. This is called E. What's E? Electric field. Right, electric field. So uh, it, 
suppose you have some positively charged thing here, which creates some electric potential. I think point charge is like V equals to negative uh, ah, K Q over R. Is that right? Might be wrong. It's this one, right? Or, or is it like negative 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Q, Q over R, right? Yeah, I think that's it, yeah. So that's, that's the electric potential, OK? Yeah, but anyways, uh, it, you have a charge that creates some electric potential, right? So you have some, some negative, uh, you have something here, and then I can't remember. OK, so, but let's, just for the sake of simplicity, let's just say that this is 10, and uh, Ralph, far away here, you have some other Let's just say this is zero volts. And you have a point here. Now, tell me the direction of the electric field. Is it this way or that way? It's from 10 to zero. Uh -huh. From 10 to zero. It's this way, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So electric field gives you the fastest decreasing direction of the, the voltage, right? Electric potential. And that's why you have a minus, because you, you know gradient points to the fastest increasing direction. You put a minus, then it, it gives you the fastest decreasing direction. Okay? So you, you have, I mean, you, you can have a bunch of other kinds of potentials. You might have a, a plate, plate like here and here. Then uh, you know that this is like, could be plus 10 volts and negative 10 volts, and then. Uh, your, your electric field will be like that, right? You, you've seen these pictures in physics too. And another important thing that you learned in physics too is that if you take a region and there's no charge inside, uh, there's the Gauss law which says, uh, uh, what's the flux of the electric field electric field over this omega, the, this region. What is that? If there's no charge captured inside, what's the flux? Hmm? Zero. It's zero, right? You, you've learned that as a Gauss theorem, right? Or uh, in, in general, the flux is like, uh, what is it? I forgot that as well. I, sh yeah, I, I wish I knew it. Uh, it's like 4 pi epsilon q or something? Something like that, right? So it's, uh, okay. So, okay. But anyways, uh, this this is what you have if there is no charge inside, right? And uh, there's another related quantity, which is if you take the flux of the electric field and you divide it by the volume and you take the limit volume to zero, uh, it's called the density of the flux. And the density of the flux, if you do this calculation, uh, you end up getting the divergence. Divergence of E. Have you heard that in Calc 3? Yes. Did anyone tell you about that? Yes. Oh, somebody did. OK, great. Yeah. OK, so uh, I, I, in, on my YouTube channel, I have like a 30-minute video trying to explain why this is true. And that's a two-dimensional calculation. So instead of volume, I divide by the area. But still, if I uh, calculate the flux around the two-dimensional region and divide by the area, you send the, the area to zero, you get the divergence of the electric field. So uh, what you end up with is uh, the electric potential, when there's no charge inside, it satisfies the following differential equation. The divergence of negative of the gradient of V must equal to zero. Okay. And this one ends up being exactly the Laplace differential equation, because if you actually do the calculation, you'll see that the divergence of the gradient of any function is the same thing as the Laplacian of f. You, you can actually calculate that. Okay? And, and since you can pull the minus outside, and if you cancel the minus, that's exactly this differential equation. 
So, uh, I mean, if you are able to imagine what the heat distribution of this thing will be like, then that solution has the same meaning as the following. Let's say you have a electric, uh, uh, you, you have a metal plate, okay, uh, conductive, and there's no charge inside, okay, and just apply 10 volts so of electricity here, okay, and you put zero volts here, zero volts here, zero volts here, and if you want to know what the shape, what's the shape of the uh, electric field here, then the answer would be exactly the same as the heat distribution that you would get as a steady state here. Okay. And both satisfy the same exact differential equation. Okay? So, uh, I guess as the limit of the heat equation, mechanical engineers will be interested. Uh, this, this way of thinking would be what uh, e electrical engineers would be drawn to, okay? So in both cases, uh, this, this is a pretty interesting problem to solve. Okay, so now let's actually solve a problem so that we can feel like we understand something here. Okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to put a coordinate system here. Let's put a coordinate system. So that, uh, let's see, I see that u of 0 comma y should be what? So you're here or here or here, what's the value of the temperature? Zero. Zero, right? Because uh, any point here is zero, 0 comma y, right? For, for y between 0 to 10. And then u of uh, 10 comma y would be what? <coughs> Look at the picture. 10 comma y should be? 80. 80, thank you. Again, uh, same thing here. And then u of x comma 0 should be? Zero, and u of uh, x comma ten would be zero. zero as well for x between zero to ten. All right, let, let me not write these. Let's just uh, save some time and, and put these together. Okay, so I, I need to save some space. So uh, u ten y is eighty. U x zero. U x ten okay. okay. So this is what we want to solve. And if we solve it, we know what the shape would be. Now once we solve it, we'll be able to answer like uh, what's the temperature here, here, or even what's the temperature in the middle. By the way, from your intuition, what do you think the temperature at the middle should be? That's zero, 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 80, so it's the average of the, the four. So what's the answer? 20. 20. It's going to be 20 degrees Fahrenheit right here. Okay? So that will be a, another thing you can verify. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's try to solve a solution. Okay, we, we have like 40 minutes left, and we have to solve it in 40 minutes. All right, so let's go on. Okay, what's, what's this first step? Step one. Hmm? What's step one? Make some guess about what it should look like. What? Make some guess about what the answer should look like. Okay, so you need some ansatz, right? What ansatz do you use? Huh? What shape do we use to find any solution? What's the shape of a solution? Yes, yes, not, not x, x, t, t here. There's no t here. Y, y, right. So you want to say u, x, y. See, u does not depend on t anymore because we, we made it steady state. It doesn't change with respect to time. So 
u will be just a function of x and y only. And we are going to write it as xx, yy. Okay. okay, and then we plug that into over here. Okay. So what's going to happen if I plug in the first one? X double prime x, y, y. Yes, x, x, y, double prime, y. Okay. Then what? We move to the other side, right? Just like that. Okay. And then as usual, we divide it by x, y. Now, uh, in the heat equation, we divide it by k times x times t. There's no k here, so you don't have to, you don't have anything to put for k. But we just divide by the product. Okay, so if you divide by the product, you get x double prime over x equals to y double prime. Oh, th this one will be minus, right? So equals to minus y double prime over y, where this is a function of x and function of y. Okay, now at this point, what's the crucial argument? It must be a constant because it's a function of x equals to function of y. There's no way you can have function of x and function of y equal to each other for all values of x and y unless they are constants, okay? And so we name it as negative lambda, okay? Uh, however, this time I want to put it as positive lambda. And the reason being is the following. Uh, if you look at this condition here, here, this is 0 and that's 0. And that really is saying that uh, y of 0 is 0 and y of 10 is 0. So you have endpoint value problem for the y. So you really want this to be the sturm liouville the y side to be the sturm liouville If you had uh, 0 here and then 80 in one of these instead, then you want to put it as negative lambda because you want the x side to be the simulable problem. Okay? All right. So this now splits into two equations, which is one is a x double prime over x equals to lambda, so that x double prime is equal to lambda times x. And you move to the other side and you get x double prime minus lambda x equals to zero. So that's one equation. And this one here, negative y double prime over y equals to negative lambda. So mu multiplying them, you get y double prime equals to, no, no, I, I made it as positive lambda, sorry, is equal to negative lambda y. And you move this to the other side, and you get y double prime plus lambda y equals to 0. So you get that, OK? And then furthermore, you have u x 0 equal to 0, which means x of x times y of 0 equals to 0, which means what? Huh? Yeah, why can't this be 0? Because you end up with a trivial u. Right? That's not what you want. So this must be 0. And same thing, u of uh, x10 equals to 0 means x of x, y of 10 equals to 0, so y of 10 equals to 0. OK, and then if you look at these, indeed, this is a sturm liouville problem. It's an endpoint value problem, and it's going to give you non-trivial solutions for only certain values of lambda, right? And uh, there are two types that we usually encounter, right? In, in this class, we only do two types, which is uh, always in this form. And either you have primes equal to 0 or the values itself equal to 0, OK? Uh, and it distinguishes the case between the sine case and the cosine case. So what do you think the, the solution of this is? Should it be the sine or the cosine? What's your take? 
Zero. Sine of zero is zero, right? Yeah. yeah. But the cosine of zero is not zero, while, while the derivative of the cosine zero is zero, because the derivative of cosine is negative sine of zero. So we know that this alone <coughs> already points to the, you, you need the sine one, not the cosine one, right? OK. So with that, we now see that the solution must be y of y equals to the sine function n pi over L. What's our L? 10. 10. OK. So that's your sign. Uh, and that, and uh, what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm really sk sk skipping steps here. You, you really need to say uh, three cases when lambda is negative, lambda is 0, and lambda is positive, and you look for when it works. Actually, you don't have to do the case when lambda is negative, because certainly all solutions don't have eigenvalues negative. But you have to go through those two things, and it takes some time. But we don't have enough time to do that, so uh, let's say we got that. Okay. Now, for this, what, what should be the lambda value? Do you remember what this one was? n squared, pi squared over 100. Yeah, yeah. so this, this happens to be square root of lambda, right? So if you square that, that's the end. That's the lambda value. Where n should start from 1 or 0. Should it start from 0 or 1? If n is 0, what happens to this function? It's a trivial function. can't be it. So n must start from 1. Right? So that's what you're going to get if you actually honestly solve this Sturm-Yogel problem. Okay? And you can even find lambda by just plugging this into here and there. If you differentiate this twice, this square will appear with a minus sign in front. So of course, lambda should be this so that they cancel. Okay. So that's another way to do it. OK, since we, we get the lambda values, now I can put that back in here and get the following equation for x, x which is x double prime minus n squared pi squared over 100 x equals to 0. And to solve this, you just need to write down the characteristic equation, which is r squared minus n squared pi squared over 100 equal to 0. And then if you solve this, uh, you get r equals to plus or minus n pi over 10. And then uh, that tells us that x must be c1 times e to the negative, uh, actually positive, n pi over and x plus c2 e to the negative n pi over 10 x. So those are the two solutions. OK, so uh, and then we multiply this with this. That will be all the possible solutions of this with the second boundary condition. Okay. Uh, however, uh, we actually want to go further. We want to impose this one as well. Okay. Now, if u0, y is 0, what does that mean? u0, y equals to 0 means x of 0, y, y is 0. So it means that x of 0 is 0, right? Because y, y being 0, again, leads to trivial solution. And if x of 0 is 0, then, then look at what happens here. If I plug in 0 and 0, I get 0 equals to c1 plus c2. So that c2 must be negative c1. And that's convenient, because then you, you end up saying that this right here should equal to c1 times e to the n pi over 10 x minus e to the negative n pi over 10 x. And then, uh, I mean, we, we could just stop here and continue, but uh, I, I still want to write this in a simpler way. So the way I, I'm going to do, it, do is I'm going to divide this by 2 and multiply by 2 here. And if you do that, there's a name for this function. What's the name for this function? Yes? Isn't that hyperbolic? It's the hyperbolic sine function, right? It's a sine hyperbolic function. Yeah. 
Very good. Okay. So that's sine hyperbolic. Okay. So this is 2C1 sine hyperbolic n pi over 10x. But uh, I'm going to rename 2C1 as just C. See, uh, C is some arbitrary constant, so I just can I can just set, set C as 2C1 to absorb that 2 inside. That makes it easier, right? Okay. So that's that's what you get as your x of x. Um, now, if you read these solutions in any textbook, a lot of times instead of writing the uh, solutions this way, uh, many textbooks write the solution as C1 cosine hyperbolic plus C2 sine hyperbolic. That's because, uh, as I explained, the cosine hyperbolic is the even part of the exponential function, and sine hyperbolic is the odd part of the exponential function. I explained that some time ago that any function can be written as sum of its even part plus the odd part. And if you do that, you, you end up, for the exponential function, you have the cosine hyperbolic and sine hyperbolic. And uh, because cosine hyperbolic is even and sine hyperbolic is odd, uh, often you can use a lot of symmetry and all that. So it makes the calculations a lot simpler. Okay, So that's why you want to use the, those two functions. Okay. Here, I didn't bother to do that, but I can still manage to get the sine hyperbolic. Okay? So either way, if, if you start with the cosine hyperbolic and, and sine hyperbolic, you get that answer a lot quicker. Uh, I just didn't want to do it too early. So you get the same answer that way. Okay? All right, so that's the end of step one. Oh, oh, actually, almost the end of step one, because now you take the product of the two, and what are you getting? If you multiply the two, you end up with uh, uh, x of x is some constant times sine hyperbolic of n pi over 10x. And y of y is sine of n pi over 10y. So that's your function. But uh, What we've succeeded in is finding a few solutions. How many solutions did we find? How many solutions did we find? Infinitely many. Why? Because n, 1, 2, 3. On yeah, one. because n could be 1, 2, 3, and so on and so on. Right? If you have that many solutions, what can you do with them? You can add them up, because if you add them up, it will still satisfy the Laplace differential equation because this is a linear differential equation. And any boundary condition that has zero will still be satisfied. Okay? The one that uh, still cannot be satisfied is this one, but we'll, we'll see later. Okay? So what I'm trying to say is that we now found that if you set uxy equals to the superposition or the linear combination, the mathematicians like to call it linear com combination, uh, engineers and physicists, they like to say superposition of these solutions, meaning you, you add them up. Okay? This fancy word for adding them up. Okay? So you add them up, Cn sine hyperbolic of n pi over 10x sine n pi over 10y, like that. Okay? And then uh, since the only condition that it does not satisfy is this one. All I have to do is to find the values of Cn that would make this one work, and then we are done. That's the solution. Okay? So let's write down what that means. So u of 10y equals to 80 would imply that 80 should equal to, to this thing <coughs> when you plug in x equals to 10. So you have summation of n equals to 1 through infinity of cn sine hyperbolic of n pi over 10 times 10 sine of n pi over 10y. And since they cancel, you have this 80 equals to summation 
n equals to 1 through infinity of c n times sine hyperbolic of n, just n pi, sine hyperbolic of n pi times sine of n pi over 10 pi. And what I want to say is that uh, although sine n pi is 0, sine hyperbolic of n pi is not 0. It's a actually a quite big value for, for a big n. Uh, so th this is actually a positive value. Uh, so you have some, some number here times c, and that's another number. So I'm, I'm trying to say that this, this right here is just some number. So in fact, what you're trying to do is you're trying to represent 80. And by the way, 80 is a function of y, OK? Uh, this equality is e equality between functions. So 80 is thought as a constant function of the function of y, as a function of y, has to equal to sum a bunch of, co a bunch of sine functions, OK? Yes? So would that sine hyperbolic uh, be 0 because sine n pi is 0? No, no, I was just explaining that. Sine n pi is 0, but sine hyperbolic of n pi is not 0, OK? OK, uh, so this is not 0, but be careful. So what this is asking us to do is to represent 80 as sum of sine functions. But we actually know what, what does that, OK? What does that? We have a tool to make that happen. What is that? Huh? Fourier series. Fourier what series? Sine series, right? So we know that Fourier sine series actually managed to make this function, make the constant function into a bunch of some coefficient times sine of n pi over 10y. If we compute Bn by the formula 2 over L integral from 0 to L, but R to L is 10, right? So I put 10 here, 10 there. 80 times sine n pi over 10y. And because it's a function of y, we have to integrate by y. OK, so that's, that's what we know. That, that's, this thing is called the Fourier sine series. Now, if you compare this with this, you can see what cn should be, right? cn times sine hyperbolic n pi must equal to bn. So if we get the bn values, all we have to do is now divide by sine hyperbolic n pi, and that's that's going to be your cn, all right? So that that and and at that point we can plug that back into this this solution here, the cn values, and we're done. Okay? So we're almost there. All we have to do is just do this integral, which is by the way very easy, right? I can bring the 80 outside. 80 divided by 10 is 8. 8 times 2 is 16. So that's going to be 16 times. Integral of sine will be cos negative cosine, but the reciprocal of this number should be in front. So it's negative, n pi, negative 10 over n pi cosine n pi over 10y. And you have to plug in 10 and 0. When you plug in 10, what do you get? Uh, yeah, you get cosine n pi, which is negative 1 to the nth power. Right? So you get 16 times negative, negative 160 over n pi, negative 1 to the nth power. That's what you get when you plug in 10. When you plug in 0, what do you get? Cosine 0 is? 1. And because you're subtracting, this becomes positive. So you get, end up with positive 160 over n pi of 1. Okay. And uh, now we are going to factor the 160 over n pi. And let's write this one first, because there's a minus there. So this is going to be 1 minus negative 1 to the nth power. That's your bn, right? OK, now tell me what cn is then. Cn is 160 over n pi, 1 minus negative 1 to the nth power, divided by what? Sine hyperbolic. Sine hyperbolic of? 
this is not zero because that's hyperbolic. Okay, that's not zero, and uh, that's a value for each n. So, provided uh, each value, you get something. Okay. Actually, you can see that if n is even, you get zero, right? Because uh, if it's even, you get one minus one, which is zero. Okay. Uh, and if you plug in n equals to 1, you get c1 equals to 160 times 2 over uh, pi divided by sine hyperbolic of pi. And if you do this, you're going to get a value of, I, I did this calculation before coming here, it's 20 point something like 3 or three, seven, something. Okay. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, this is not the one. Uh, I, I get the value a little later. Sorry, sorry. You, you, you need to, you get this value, but uh, you have to do something more to get the 20. Sorry, this is not 20. Okay. But anyways, uh, so we got the value. What do we do? Now we have the answer, right? So the final answer. So answer is that uxy equals the summation of n equals to 1 through infinity, uh, 160 over n pi, 1 minus negative 1 to the nth power over sine hyperbolic of n pi times sine hyperbolic of n pi over 10x times sine of n pi over 10y. So that's your answer. All right. That was hard work. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, there are a few things I, I still want to say after this, which uh, uh, and the first one being, in the beginning, I said this should be 20, right? Uh, and I was curious to know whether that's the case, so I, I tried to compute that. So if you plug in 5 comma 5, u 5 comma 5 would be like, summation of n equals to 1 through infinity, 160 over n pi, 1 minus negative 1 to the nth power over sine hyperbolic of n pi times uh, sine hyperbolic of n pi over 10 times 5, sine of n pi over 10 times 5, and uh, this one will be 5 over 10 is 2, right? So this is just going to be 2. And this will, again will be 2. So you have this, and it's supposed to be 20. <laughs> so how, how do you verify this? It's kind of puzzling, right? So what, what I did was I, I put into the calculator just for the case when n is 1. And when I did that, I got... 20.3 something. Okay, pretty close, right? And then when you plug in 2, it's going to give you 0 because 1 minus 1 is 0. And when you plug in 3, then you get some value, but that value quickly drops down really fast. So the next value is like in point something, and, and that gets subtracted and added, and so, so on and so on. And so it quickly converges to 20, which I think should be the case. Okay? So uh, it does agree, uh, and uh, in fact, if you draw this graph uh, as a heat map, uh, you can see that you, you get what you think it should be the answer, so that's pretty good. Okay, so uh, a few more comments. Uh, so once you've seen this solution, you might wonder what you would do if you had Here's 80, but what if you had 40 here and 0, 0? How would you solve this one? And this should 
make you pause for a moment because, see, the reason we are able to solve this one was because you had zero in both sides, which gave you a extremely oval problem. Okay? But if you have zero and then 40, that's not extremely oval. So you can't solve it using extremely oval. And this requires a completely different strategy. Actually, almost the same, but slightly different. So you, you think of this as the following. Think of the boundary case when you have 40 and then 0, 0, 0. And then think of the case when you have 80 and 0, 0, 0. Now this one will give you a stern oval in this direction. For the x, you're going to get stern oval. This one, you, you're going to get stern oval for the y direction. And you add them up, those two solutions will give you this one because the, this differential equation is linear. Okay. So, so this one will be like, 0, 0, but uh, this will be 0, but this will be 40. That, that's what you solve, okay? So uh, I'm trying to say that uh, in general, if you have various boundary conditions, what you need to do is you need to break up the, the Laplace equation into uh, different boundary conditions with at least three sides being 0, okay? Uh, that way you can solve it. If you don't have it, then it becomes harder to track. So. You really want it that way. Okay? So that's what, what I want to say uh, first. And then uh, let me give you another way to understand why this has to be exactly 20. Okay? Uh, because uh, to get the value, you have to do this infinite series. You're not sure if it's going to be 20. So he here's another take on why this should be exactly 20. So first, Think about what the solution might be if you had 80, 80, 80, 80. What's the solution of the Laplace equation if you have this? 80 all the way, right? Because that's the, if the heat distribution is like this, and you make it evolve for a long time, it's going to even out. So it'll be 80 totally, right? But look, this will be sum of one side with 80 and 0, 0, 0, plus another side with 80 here and then 0, 0, 0, plus another side with 80 here and then 0, 0, 0, another side with 80. These four questions should have, add up to this solution, right? And although uh, they're different differential equation, they're symmetric. So if you rotate it with respect to the center, they, they're all the same thing, right? So if you have the value here at the center, all of the temperatures here should be the same value, right? And they have to add up to this value, which we know to be 80. So what's, what's the temperature here? 20 each, right? So it has to be exactly 20. That's why I do know that this value should convert to 20 if you actually did the calculation. Yeah, so that's another interesting thing you can do with this, OK? All right, so hopefully with this example, you can uh, see what Laplace PD does okay, and how you solve it. You had one side with a zero boundary condition, could you subtract? Uh, say that again? Like if you had 80, 80, 80, and zero, could you subtract <laughs> three? Like, oh, <laughs> like that? that's a really good point. Yeah, OK, so <laughs> this is what he's saying. So if you were to solve a, a differential equation with this boundary condition, right? What you can do is you can subtract 80 from u. So if this is sense by u, let v be u minus 80. Then what happens with v is that it's going to get, give you 0, 0, 0, and negative 80 here, right? So this one, because of this, you can solve it. So you can solve this and just add 80 later. That okay. was my question. But yeah, that, that wasn't your... <laughs> well, I was just asking you if you could add three of them and then subtract one. Oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> But I just want to say that this, this is also possible. It's, it's a very, yeah, it's, there are many tricks you can do because we know that at least for the plane, a, any linear function will satisfy the, the Laplace PDE. So you can add or subtract and do all kinds of tricks with it. Okay?